and welcome to another fabulous episode of Thyroid Refresh TV, a podcast dedicated to helping you live a thyroid healthy lifestyle. We're so glad to be back with you again. I'm Dana Bowman. And I'm Jenny Mahar, and we are the dynamic duo behind Thyroid Refresh and Thyroid 30. And we are so excited to be here today with Dr. Terry Walls to talk about developing resilience. This is going to be a great conversation, guys. So welcome, Dr. Walls. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thank you for having me. Okay, before we dive in, for those few people who don't know very much about Terry Walls, I want to give you a little bit of her background. Dr. Terry Walls is an Institute for Functional Medicine certified practitioner and a clinical professor of medicine at the University of Iowa where she conducts clinical trials. In 2018, she was awarded the Institute for Functional Medicine's Linus Pauling Award for her contributions in research, clinical care, and patient advocacy. That's very exciting. She is also a patient with secondary progressive multiple sclerosis, which confined her to a tilt reclined wheelchair for four years. It's an incredible story, guys. Dr. Walls restored her health using a diet and lifestyle program she designed specifically for her brain and now pedals her bike to work each day. That is amazing. She is the author of The Walls Protocol, a radical new way to treat all chronic autoimmune conditions using paleo principles. We're so glad to have you. Thank you so much. We've been so excited for this show because you've been such a beacon of hope to so many chronically ill people. And I know you've told your story hundreds of times by now, but it's so inspiring. And we were hoping you could maybe share that with our listeners before we dive in. Sure. So I'm a uh, academic internal medicine uh, physician here at the University of Iowa uh, and at the OCDBA. Uh, and was uh, very conventional, skeptical of special diets and supplements. Uh, but in 2000, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And being an academic doc, I wanted to get the best care possible. So I sought out the best MS centers here in the Midwest, saw their best people, took the newest drugs, and relentlessly went downhill. Uh, two years into this, my physicians told me about the work of Lauren Cordain. I read his books, his papers, and decided after 20 years of being a low-fat vegetarian to go back to eating meat. I continued to go downhill. Uh, then I took um, uh, my Zantron, then I took uh, Tizabri, continuing to relentlessly go downhill, and then continued on you know, disease-modifying drug after disease-modifying drug, uh, continuing to relentlessly decline. Uh, and it was very clear that the best conventional medicine was not likely to stop my slide into a bedridden, demented, and quite possibly intractable pain uh, life, because I also have trigeminal neuralgia. And that's when I started experimenting based on what I was studying myself, reading the basic science um, and ancestral health principles, uh, focusing at first on uh, supplements. And I slowed my decline. I reduced my fatigue ever so slightly. By 2007, I could not sit up anymore. I was in a tilt recline wheelchair with my knees higher than my nose. Um, I could walk very short distances using two walking sticks. I was beginning to have trouble with brain fog, and I was having more and more severe problems with trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, and that's why I discovered the Institute for Functional Medicine. I took the course on neuroprotection. I had a longer list of supplements, which I added. I, and then uh, later that summer, I had a, a really big aha moment. Like, what, what if I redesign my paleo diet in a very specific way to stress these nutrients? So that would take more research uh, and focus. I, and I uh, did that. And to my amazement, you know, the uh, fatigue went away, the pain went away, and I started getting stronger. I, and within uh, six months, I'm up walking around uh, without a cane. I'm on my bike for the first time uh, in six years, and I bike around the block. I'm crying, my kids are crying, my wife's crying. Uh, and uh, that's when I realized like the conventional understanding of MS is incomplete. Uh, and in six more months, I'm able to do a 20 mile bike ride with my family. Uh, so this really transforms how I think about disease and health. And it would ultimately transform uh, the focus of the research that I do. And in fact, 
that is now what I research, which is the use of diet and lifestyle to treat um, uh, multiple sclerosis. Wow, it's it's such Ooh. an amazing story, and the work that you've done and the research you've done has helped so many people now who are on this shared path. I think not just MS patients, but autoimmune patients. That's something I honestly didn't realize before I became an autoimmune patient that MS is an autoimmune condition. Yeah, um, you know, it, and we're also beginning to realize that many people who have chronic fatigue, chronic pain brain fog, have autoantibodies, and they're in that prodrome where uh, they'll have that for a few years to a few decades, then they develop their overt autoimmune diagnosis. And for many with MS, we have a prodrome that's 10 to 20 years. And in my case, it was uh, 20 years. Wow. Mm, that's incredible. Mm. And you know, I mean, you say this, and I've heard this story, you being in your wheelchair, seeing the pictures of you and that, you know, now you're up walking around and biking to work. And it's, it's really just, it's kind of surreal because you, you yeah. hear the story, you know, and it's, you it's, know, and, I, and I look good. I look healthy. I look like, you know, fabulous. I, I yeah. look far younger than my stated age. And, um, and it's, what's interesting is I didn't let people take pictures of me in the wheelchair. So I only have a half dozen photos mm. of me in the wheelchair. Uh, there are a couple of photos uh, in 2007 where I look really terrible. Um, I'm probably looking 10 years, uh, maybe 15 years older than stated age. I look very gray and ashen. I, and so, of course, it's interesting now. I cherish those few photos that I have of me um, uh, because nobody believes that I was that ill. Right. I mean, it, it and, really, and who would have thought at the time, you know, you really needed to get your picture taken so that you could have proof to what's possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Or, or how, how much I, I treasure uh, all of that time. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, I had 27 years of relentless worsening of the trigeminal neuralgia. And, and that's a very, very difficult thing to have to deal with. You get these jolts of electrical pain across either this side or this side, spreads across, um, it, and it's so intense. I can't walk, I can't uh, talk, uh, I'm grimacing. I get to the point where I, I can't swallow because swallowing triggers the pain, so I start drooling. I, and, and so I had come to terms with the fact that I was gonna become bedridden, I was gonna become demented. I hadn't yet come to terms with the fact that my greatest fear was that my pain would turn on. It wouldn't turn off and I'd be stuck with intractable, uncontrolled pain. Mm. It just <laughs> makes your heart hurt just imagining, empathizing what that must have been like to be in that place. That was the summer of 2007. Wow. Uh, and of course now, um, actually, I, I, I'm very... I, I am very grateful for my trigeminal neuralgia uh, because now I, so I have this amazing biosensor that um, if the level of inflammation in my spinal cord goes up a little bit, I begin getting that discomfort here or here. And I know that my face pain is going to turn on soon. I, and so it gives me a chance to really reflect deeply on what's going on in my environment. That is love, that's increasing my inflammation, turning on my face pain. So I have this incredibly sensitive biosensor to the level of inflammation in my microglia, in my brain and spinal cord, uh, and in my body. Um, I, and so after decades of fearing my face pain, actually I'm now quite grateful for that face pain because it is such a sensitive biosensor to how effective my chemistry is. Talk about mm -hmm. silver lining. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Incredible. It, it may take a long time to figure out what that gift is, but there's always a gift uh, in our life circumstances. Mm. I love thinking mm -hmm. of it that way. <clears throat> well, you've put, you know, your story, your healing journey, and the method behind your recovery story and how you're helping other patients 
also recover in your book, The Walls Protocol. And you've got a new book coming out. It's a, the revision of The Walls yeah. Protocol, a radical new way to treat all chronic autoimmune conditions using paleo principles. Can you tell us what's in this new revision? So, you know, um, so my original book uh, uh, talked about my story and my theories about what I, why I developed what I did. In these intervening five years, there's been a lot of forward progress on the research uh, in terms of how the food choices and the lifestyle choices turn genes on and off. Uh, there's so much more research that's come out in terms of the microbiome and how the gut bacteria really speak to our immune cells in our gut. Uh, and that the gut bacteria also speak to our immune cells in our brain that level up the inflammation or calm it down. Uh, so a lot of updates there. We update all the research we've done in our lab. Uh, and there's so much more information about diet. Uh, so I have a lot more uh, nuance on the dietary recommendations that I have and how to personalize uh, the walls protocol and, and the diet based on your symptoms and your other health issues. So we can really dial this in to be much more specific. Uh, and of course, uh, you'll really enjoy this one. I talk a lot more about emotional resilience, metabolic resilience. Uh, and then uh, some uh, for my MS audience, uh, there's been a lot of forward progress on uh, rehabilitation and on the use of electrical stimulation. And I'm pleased to say I'm one of the uh, four leaders uh, on the use of electrical stimulation uh, for rehab. So lots of new information. About a third of the content uh, is new information. Wow. Well, and you're always, you know, researching and, and conducting studies, and we're so grateful for that in this community because, you know, we were talking about this before the show. That's how we're going to be able to drive change for healthcare for people like us. You know, absolutely. We want our medical care to be based on science, to be based on uh, peer-reviewed, published uh, literature. We all agree. Uh, and so if we're going to change that, we have to be willing to uh, do that research. Now that means you have to write grants, you can get funding, you can do the research. I'm in a unique position because I've impacted the lives of millions of people, some of whom have money and who understand the work that I'm doing and are willing to make philanthropic gifts to my lab. So I'm able to conduct the preliminary data to write what makes it easier to write competitive grants, and so I'm the person who's doing um, integrative and functional medicine research in the autoimmune patient. Uh, so, yes. It, it, so it, exciting. It, we couldn't ask for anybody better. Yeah. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I, uh, I'm grateful to get my life back. Uh, and I, I just feel this moral obligation to teach the, you know, it's actually, it's, it's pretty interesting. So the university at first was very, they didn't quite know what to make of the fact uh, you know, I have this health experience. I've changed how I practice. I'm, I'm talking to the public about what I'm doing and why, uh, and I'm doing research. And you don't normally talk about your research, you know, at the same time. While you're doing right. Uh, while you're doing it. So I can't talk about the the results, but I can talk about what I'm doing and why. And they're afraid that that make it hard for you to get funding. What what they discovered is the fact that I do that makes it easier for me to get funding because. Uh, people are, are willing to donate to my research lab. Um, so we're getting ready to uh, begin doing our, our fifth clinical trial. I, and um, uh, that's very exciting. And now the university is like, oh my God, uh, they're celebrating me as this brilliant innovator. Uh, and they'd like me to teach other scientists how to be more entrepreneurial and how to talk about what they're doing in a public way uh, to get uh, more public awareness. Hmm. It's so important. And I, I'm glad you address that because I was curious, mm -hmm. you know, if you had gotten pushback from your colleagues. Oh, there's... yeah. You know, early on, I, I got immediate pushback. I had to go meet with my chief of staff and the chief of uh, medicine at the university to explain what I was doing and why. But because, you know, I'm very science based, I brought with me all my scientific, or a, a handful of papers and went through them paper by paper. And so I won them all over. Uh, and so they had me meet with the chief of ambitor of uh, complementary alternative medicine to show me how to document what I was doing in the medical record so everybody would be comfortable. 
and I could pass a peer review in case somebody complained who was very deeply skeptical, because we can't have me losing a license because I don't know how to document things correctly. So we address that. I'm very clear about the disclaimers I put out when I'm talking publicly about what I'm doing, that I'm improving cellular physiology, that, and then monitoring patient outcomes and reducing medications as clinically appropriate so people aren't over-medicated. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that message is very comfortable for the university setting. Uh, and that made it agreeable to my uh, university peers, uh, NVA peers. Uh, and that's allowed me to, to grow my standing to be successful in writing grants and be very successful in teaching the public. Mm. It's, you know, sitting in the patient chair, so many of us hear that uh, we face that resistance in, in the doctor's office. I know my doctor told me diet wouldn't make a difference at all. Oh, yeah. And I just read another healing story yesterday. Someone put their Hashimoto's into remission and she went into her doctor's office and they said, this is, oh. a, this is an anomaly and I don't even want to hear about your diet. You know, you know it's, it's interesting. So, so, here, so I'm trying to coach people, uh, here's how you deal with your conventional physician. We're all taught in medical school that the first thing you should do with somebody who has chronic symptoms is you address diet and lifestyle. And you do that before prescribing any medication that someone's going to be on for the rest of their life. Uh, and so, it, it, in my mind, it is malpractice to not start with diet and lifestyle to mm -hmm. improve cellular physiology to not start with these radical things known as vegetables, to not start with these radical things as known as getting rid of the sugar in the processed foods. That is the correct step one for everyone. And then if you can't get control of, of, the, of the chronic symptoms, yeah, then you're gonna need to take it to the next level, either more thorough use of diet and lifestyle, or you may need prescription medication. Now, what, what um, I think we can, but what I'm trying to teach people is you tell your physician that, you know what, I'm going to really improve my diet. I'm getting rid of the junk food. I'm going to focus on vegetables uh, and high quality protein. And just wa watch and uh, make any adjustments. Uh, I just don't want to get over medicated. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we take that approach is, you know, that's fine. I'm just cleaning up my diet. And if, they, if they're not excited about dumping sugar and processed food and adding vegetables, go talk to your primary care doc they should be and if they're not fire them and get a new one <laughs> amen to that so that's, yes. I mean, that's pretty straightforward and so all you're all you're doing is i'm getting rid of the junk food i'm adding in more vegetables and work with your primary care doc don't worry about your specialist just let them know please monitor and so if things change adjust my bed so i don't get over medicated and if they're not comfortable with that then you know you have to get yourself a new specialist because if, if a specialist isn't concerned about over medicating you, then they aren't monitoring you appropriately. That's a very good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I know we're very eager to dive into um, the mindset mm -hmm. piece of the journey at the, and how you're helping, you know, clients with that. But um, maybe before we go there, can we cover the key parts of the diet and lifestyle plan you're using in your clinics? Yeah, you know, uh, so I can sort of think of this in a, in a stepwise fashion. Uh, the first thing is I, I want people to get rid of the sugar, the processed foods, and to swap out uh, the processed foods, remove those, and add in vegetables, preferably green leafy vegetables, uh, deeply pigmented things like carrots, beets, berries, uh, and uh, the cabbage, onion, mushroom family vegetables. And then we need a good source of protein. And I have plans for vegetarian uh, and vegans, and I have plans for meat eaters. Uh, I, then I, I, I sort out, uh, do we have to think about a low lectin or a more specialized uh, version of the diet, depending on uh, the person's unique medical issues? So that's, that's the dietary uh, parts of this. Uh, and then um, the it, stress reduction, we, we have, to have some way of normalizing the cortisol hormones. We talk about that. Uh, and we talk about the critical role of gravity, of exercise. And again, I, I evaluate where the person is at presently. And we have to have a gradual, systematic 
uh, way of increasing the physical activity. You don't want to be too rapid or you're going to uh, overtrain them and get into trouble. Um, uh, but the, the, really the very first thing I like to do is understand what they want their health for. Because um, this is gonna be a lot of work. Uh, and in order to be willing to do that work, it's very helpful to have a, well, here, this is what I want my health for. Here is my big goal. And I like to have people have a big physical goal. Um, and it might be like um, dancing with your son or daughter at their wedding. Mm -hmm. or seeing your kids graduate from high school or college or get married or the grandchild. Uh, and so once we have that in mind, then we talk about what is the tiny, tiny, tiny little actionable next step that you can take. Uh, and then we begin to slowly build on next step, next step, next step. Mm. We love that. Yeah, we get really yeah. excited. We get really jazzed up talking about these things because this is so much of what fuels Dana and I's fire. This is our passion and our mission as well as helping people, you know, define their why and sort of how do we dissect the process of making successful lifestyle changes? Because the reality is it can be difficult to stick with these changes. So how do you, how do you help people sustain so, those healthy changes? You know, um, I acknowledge that the way our, our brains work is that we get a lot of pleasure uh, and attention for the things that are pleasurable, and we will do more of that. It is very hard to forego those pleasures for a theoretic benefit in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a lot of people know that, yes, that's, that's why uh, it's hard to give up those foods. Uh, processed foods are designed to create addictions and dependence and overconsumption. And so you're not crazy uh, in acknowledging that it's really hard to give that stuff up. So then I step over into the addiction science. Um, and like, okay, so some of the things that we know are having uh, a meaning, purpose, connection, uh, a mentor's uh, peer support sponsor, that's very helpful. Uh, addressing your environment, things that are tempting that you know you will struggle with, you get out of your environment because if you see it, now you have to resist the, that urge continuously you'll wear down. If all you have to do is walk by it, by it at the store so it doesn't get into your cart and it's not at home tempting you, that's a very short time I'm gonna be much more successful than having it sit in front of me mm -hmm. every day for the rest of my life. So, uh, so I, I, we talk about purpose meeting, we talk about addiction science, we talk about health behavior change, I, and uh, then we have a, a discussion like, okay, so given all of that, uh, what would you like to do? Uh, because it's the person's life. They're the one who's gonna um, have to sort out what are the things that they could implement and what next steps uh, could they take? And who, who would the, their mentor or sponsor or peer support be? How, that was kind of my next question mm -hmm. is, how does community come into play? You know, actually my vets taught me this one that um, you know, people don't change uh, on the basis of information. Information is really helpful, but it's never gonna be enough. Uh, most of us, are uh, we have a need for a tribal, um, a, a small uh, social network. Uh, and so having a social network, whether it's in person or virtually, that you, you're talking uh, via phone, via letters, via uh, social media, via video calls, it uh, can be very helpful for um, celebrating your successes, acknowledging your struggles, uh, problem solving your difficulties. There will be a few people, not many, but a few, you know, who can read my book, be inspired, go through their house, dump all the crap out, and be immediately successful. Many more will find it much, they're much more successful if they do this with the context of peer support within their family unit and within their network of friends. Mm -hmm. We're all about that. We're cheerleaders over here. So 
Yes. We totally yeah. understand. People yeah. are much more successful in the VA when I, I created the Therapeutic Lifestyle Clinic. Um, we I, originally I saw people one one by one. Quickly, there was too much demand. I couldn't cope with that, and I wanted to get everyone in. So I started doing group visits. And what I discovered was, wow, we're much more effective in group visits. Much more effective when I had a group, a small group of people, you know, six to twenty. I'd say 12 is probably the ideal number uh, that would get together every month talking about the journey. And they taught me a lot. And uh, certainly the biggest message was behavior change is most effective in a social network. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. we have experienced that 100% when we play thyroid 30, that's our seasonal wellness adventure that it's like an opportunity for people to make progress towards their goals and they play on teams and that is hands down the most powerful part of the game is the team aspect because it's so motivating to see a that you're not alone and b that there's other people out there who are faced with similar challenges and they're making the positive choices and they're they're reaping the rewards of those healthy choices and it's just and they're also human and they also have days where they didn't have so many successes. And so you're like, okay, so this person's real. You didn't just, you know, blow it out of the water immediately. You, you had a setback and that's okay. And we still support you and love you. And, and life is like that. Life is yeah. messy. It's complicated. We screw up. Mm -hmm. um, we're all human. Uh, we all are deeply flawed. Uh, and we all have our angels and our demons that live. Uh, within us, uh, and hopefully we're all learning to uh, celebrate uh, the more uh, beneficial, nurturing, loving parts of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So resilience, how, talk to us about resilience. How does it help us and how do we develop it? Can it be developed? You know, um, there's a lovely book uh, that I read, uh, Viktor Frankl's uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, he is a uh, Jewish psychiatrist who was imprisoned during World War II in one of the death camps. His wife was uh, killed. After he got out of that, um, after the war, he wrote, he wrote this really remarkable book uh, where he described what he, his experience of seeing people uh, go through tremendous acts of cruelty uh, and uh, tremendous acts of love and selflessness. Uh, and uh, his uh, promise was that between every event in our lives and our response to it, there's always a space. And in that space, we make a choice, and that choice defines our character. Uh, and so uh, I really I like that book a, a lot. Uh, and when I'm diagnosed with MS, I have two young kids, uh, ages eight and five. And I know that young children may or may not listen to what their parents say, but they're certainly going to watch what their parents do. And so I could model giving up when life was difficult, or I could model that, yep, life's not easy, it's not fair, it's hard, and you get up, you do the best you can no matter what. I, and so I, that was sort of my mantra as I was doing my workouts and as I was trying to figure out what, what all to do, it was while well, your kids are watching. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, that's part of why uh, I, I spend a lot of time with my patients as what is your why? What is your mission? And that if it's bigger than you, the bigger the mission, the bigger the inner drive, uh, that probably the more willing you are to keep doing things that, that may be difficult. Mm -hmm. That is such a powerful why for anyone out there with children. Mm -hmm such a, I think one of the greatest gifts of parenthood is that it gives us that yeah. you know, they're watching. We have to model that positive behavior and we want to enjoy, you know, that was always my big why driving changes I was making is I want to be the mother that my son deserves, that I want to be for him. And I, for a long time, wasn't able to do that until I started making diet and lifestyle changes and yeah, and I'd say that's uh, certainly very true for um, many, many uh, moms. 
uh, we will do a lot more for our kids than we will do for ourselves. Wow. That, um, and dads will do a lot for their kids uh, because the, the vast majority of parents are deeply devoted to our children and we want, we want to do right by them. Uh, and so the more we can link to, well, if you wanna do right for your kids, you wanna be well, then that's gonna be the trade off of letting go of some of these short temporary pleasures for this long-term pleasure that is deeply meaningful to you of uh, enjoying being able to play with your kids and Absolutely. watching your children uh, grow up and watching your children uh, acquire the skills of being successful adults. Um, so the more I can connect, the reason you're forgoing this immediate pleasure is for this much more meaningful long-term pleasure. Then I'm like, okay, I can do that. If it's, if it's not deeply meaningful to me, then hell no, I'm not going to give up that immediate pleasure. Right. So and it's, and it has to be uh, something that's meaningful to the patient. It, it can't be meaningful to me. Like, who cares? It has to be deeply meaningful to that person. And so that's where a conversation with that person about what is it that is deeply meaningful to you? And is there a way to link why you want to give up this short-term immediate pleasure? to help you be more successful in this long-term goal and pleasure. You know, I think mine, mine was a little bit more obscure and kind of came about in a, in a backwards, different kind of way, but it was this, the same effect. I was living this life in Texas and Dallas, and I knew it wasn't serving me and my husband as well, and we picked up and moved to Costa Rica. And wow. then a couple years later is when I was diagnosed while living there. And then looking back now on the whole thing, I knew somehow that I was probably going to get sick continuing the way I was living and that that was really what I felt like was needed in order to shake it up, in order to do something different, in order to look at things. I didn't know how and I didn't really know the why immediately, but looking back, that's exactly it because everything about my life changed and my kids' lives and my husband's life on every level for the better but it was kind of like the cart before the horse in, in a way. Um, but looking back, it's, it's the same in the end. It was amazing. Good. Is it accurate to say then that how we develop resilience is it just, just by choosing it? Mm -hmm. um, yes. We, we, we take little actions that will grow our resilience. Uh, there certainly is a process uh, that we could be helped with. Uh, by having a coach or a mentor who could uh, ask questions and then wait uh, for you to begin to answer that in your life and begin to see the connections. You know, uh, growing resilience generally is not a process uh, that you can get by giving statements, hmm. but you can often help your patients uh, with resilience by asking uh, relevant questions and then waiting for them to begin to answer those questions in their lives. Mm -hmm. One really powerful question, I think in so many life situations where you see someone struggling is, what do you think would solve that problem for you? Mm -hmm. Or what do you have to learn from this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What must you learn? Who must you become? Mm -hmm. And then another step further would be, and what can you do and who can you teach and what can you share after you've learned? How can you get back to your job? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been really wanting to ask you about um, something that I read about in um, one of your articles or maybe an email a while back. This has been in our notes for a long time, but there's a positive psychology and lifestyle practice that you teach called the oh, pleasant yeah. life, the good life, and the meaningful life. What does that mean? What are they? And how do we define those ideals for ourselves? So... Um and this is a very important concept I like to have people work through um, right now in their present health circumstance. So it's not that, you know, once I can begin to run again, then I'm going to have a good life. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. You're in a wheelchair. You're 
dependent, you can't sit up anymore. We're going to help you work through how you can have a pleasant life, good life, meaningful life in your current life. Uh, and so the pleasant life has to do with what are the things that you can enjoy right now that give you pleasant sensations, pleasant feelings, pleasant experiences. Uh, and so as I work through this with my patients, um, I say, okay, so it, when I was wheelchair dependent, couldn't sit up, I could still help my dog. Um, I, you know, I could still enjoy a lovely cup of tea. I could still go sit outside in our yard, uh, lay um, uh, in the yard and enjoy uh, the sun. The sun. On my face. So those were pleasant sensations that I could enjoy that did not require me to sit up and walk around. Uh, and so they could be like, okay, so what pleasant sensations can you enjoy? And how, and how can you get them? Okay, so now we have pleasant down. And the next one is good. So um, what are the things that you could do that would be helpful for someone else, perhaps in your family unit? So again, in my circumstance, couldn't sit up anymore, uh, but I could lay in bed uh, or sit uh, with my kids and read to them. Okay, and I could enjoy that, yes. Um, so that's a way of having a good life. I could help my uh, children memorize their lines for the school play. And so, yes, uh, so that's a way of having a good life. Uh, and then uh, the meaningful life, how do you give back to someone outside of your uh, tribe in the meaningful way? So, uh, and this is actually, so in my circumstance, can't sit up, can't walk around, so I could go in my tilt reclined wheelchair uh, and I, I could write a uh, case for um, the medical students about, uh, and you write a case and they review the cases uh, week by week. And then you get a lecture from the faculty member about that disease state. So I wrote a case about being about a uh, patient being evaluated for a trigeminal neuralgia that then became converted into multiple sclerosis. Uh, and then instead of giving a lecture on multiple sclerosis, I gave a lecture on what it's like as a patient to go through having a progressive illness that keeps getting worse and worse and worse, and um, what it's like emotionally to go through that. Uh, and that what my was giving back to the students about how to become uh, better, more empathic physicians. Uh, and so again, uh, helping my patients figure out what is it they could do right now, given their physical disability, that gives back to their church, their school, uh, their extended family, uh, that they could do right now with their current physical limitations. That is transformative. Mm -hmm. Once we get people into pleasant, realize that they can have a pleasant, good, and meaningful life right now, that uh, really provides a great deal more meaning, resilience, and connection to others. Mm -hmm. And if you could find those from the place of your rock bottom, <laughs> then anyone can. You know, it's everyone just, can, yeah. right? We all, right. we all, as long as we're alive, we can do this. It may need some coaching and mentoring on on how to find this. I, I, and you know, that's, um, I, I discussed this at length in my book. Uh, and I think this is a very important part of growing resilience, growing joy uh, in our life, and growing joy in our family and social units. Mm. That was really profound. Um, yeah, it really affected me. I, I'm <laughs> just the way you said it and, and knowing your story and knowing my story, knowing Jenny's story, yeah. hearing other stories. Thank you for sharing that. Um, it really hit in a, in a way that I'm going to look at things different now. It so strikes such you. a chord. And yes, th I just want to echo that and say thank you. Uh, you know, on behalf of our whole audience, mm -hmm. Dana and I um, have surveyed our audience a couple times now. So we've got about 1,700 survey respondents. And one of the questions we asked them was, what's your biggest challenge right now in regards to trying to live a, what we call a thyroid healthy lifestyle, you know, and yeah. living well with, with your thyroid condition. 
And far and away, the number one answer is I feel too tired and sick to do anything about it. Well, um, I have a couple of thoughts on that. Uh, certainly one is we, we want to figure out the resilience, how they can have uh, the pleasant, good, and meaningful life mm -hmm. right now as exhausted as they are. And of course, they'll be challenged with that. Uh, and the other is in my protocol, I, and it's very consistent uh, in my clinics, in my clinical trials, um, is that as I teach people how to implement the WALS protocol, fatigue lessens, energy improves, quality of life improves, joy improves. That's one of the very first symptoms that everyone experiences. Mm. Or I should say nearly everyone experiences. It's, it's very rare. And the people who aren't experiencing that, typically are, are uh, we, they get around to admitting that, well, you know, I'm doing the protocol about 80%. You know, and in life, uh, in college or high school, if you got an 80% on an exam, that was probably a B. And people feel like, you know, that's pretty good. Huh? But for answering the question, could diet and lifestyle turn off your serious autoimmune problems? You have to do it 100%. You have to actually- There's no real B. <laughs> you have to do the experiment. If I did an experiment and I just did the, the intervention at 80%, or 90% or 95%, that would be a fucking hell. Mm -hmm. you know? Right? <laughs> that would just be terrible. I would be, you know, you can't run uh, an experiment that way. You can't answer right. the question, could a diet and lifestyle make a difference unless you actually do the diet and lifestyle? Mm -hmm. If you do the diet and lifestyle for 100 days, 100%, and that doesn't help, now we have to figure out, and then, you know, actually, I, I've now learned to have people uh, test the urine or stool for gluten. And often what they discover is like, wait a minute, there's still gluten in my urine or stool. Where is that coming from? And then they have to do a little sleuthing to figure out where it is coming from. Uh, and then when they finally actually get it out, then they discover their energy is improving. Oh, and oh. Is improving. That, that's when they finally realized that they had to take this really, really seriously, read all, all the labels on all the food, make sure all of their supplements are gluten-free, make sure their medication is gluten-free. And then finally, when there's no gluten in the urine or stool, like, okay, now the experiment has finally begun. Mm. So go, go all the way. All go the way. all in. Yeah. Well, you gotta go all in. You know, a, a few people will get better on an eighty percent level, but the vast majority you have to do it one hundred percent. I think a, another important message for for some of us to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and certainly it's true when we recover and we're doing really well. I'm two years into this recovery, three years into this recovery. I'm invited to my niece's wedding. And there's wedding cake. I don't want to offend my brother. So I have the wedding cake. And then like, oh my God, I, do I feel terrible? Yes, life happens. I just dust yourself back up. Move and on. Get, and right. like, okay, that was not a good decision. I'll have to make a different one next time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or you just take it and say thank you. And then you go in the corner and then you set it down. <laughs> yeah. All right. right. You, you, you figure out a different way of managing that problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, for anyone out there who, who is curious to learn more about the Walls Protocol, you can get a one-page summary of the Walls Protocol diet that Dr. Walls uses in her clinics and clinical trials at terrywalls.com slash diet. So this is a great uh, guide for the fridge, and we'll be sure and include that in the show notes, um, as well as the link to your, uh, your new book, The Revision of the Walls Protocol. Um, before we sign off, what, what are your main takeaways for the listeners today? You know, uh, the main uh, takeaways, you want to link uh, to your purpose. Why do you want to do this? So you're willing to do the work. Uh, you want to swap out the processed foods in their place, have more vegetables. Uh, and um, you want to get up and walk around, uh, be physically active. Uh, it's, but do it at a very slow, measured pace. Uh, so that if, if you make the changes too rapidly, 
you'll overtrain and get yourself into trouble. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you just so much for being here with us today for all the work that you've done. It's such important work in the world, Dr. Walls. So for our listeners, you can learn more at terrywalls.com and that's T-E-R-R-Y-W-A-H-L-S. Um, thank you all for joining us for another episode of Thyroid Refresh TV, where we give you the inspiration and information you need to live thyroid healthy. You can receive a free Thyroid Thrivers Grocery Guide by visiting us at thyroidrefresh.com. And to learn more about Thyroid 30, our revolutionary 30-day wellness adventure, you can go to thyroidrefresh.com slash thyroid30. You do have the power to heal, and we have the tools. Um, and we're just so thrilled to, to have had this show with you today, Dr. Wells. So thank you again. Thank and you. If you've enjoyed this podcast and would like to help us continue inspiring and empowering thyroid patients worldwide, please leave us a review on iTunes. It would make our day. You are what makes this community the amazing resource that it is. And we so appreciate your listenership and support. We're Dana and Jenny wishing you the best of health. See you next time, guys. Thanks so much. See you much. next time.